So welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to see all of you in the auditorium here today. And welcome, um, good morning, and also good afternoon, I would say, and, and good evening to those of you who are with us on YouTube. My name is Liv Ingeborg Lieb, and I am the director of the MF Center for the Advanced Study of Religion, or MF CASER, and I'll be chairing the event of the 2023 MF CASER Annual Lecture today. So the MF CASER Annual Lecture is, as the name suggests, an annual event which allows the center to invite a renowned international scholar to Oslo to give a lecture of their choice to an academic audience. The 2023 annual lecture is the fifth in the row, the former lectures being by Elizabeth Sackman Hurd, Ute Husken, Annette Yoshiko Reed, and Achil M. Dembe. I am very pleased to welcome this year's lecturer, Professor Egil Asprem, to Oslo and to MF Kasser. Asprem is a professor of the study of religion at Stockholm University in Sweden. He is perhaps best known for his research on early modern European esotericism. He is the author of a series of books and articles, among them Arguing with Angels, Enochian Magic and Modern Occulture, and The Problem of Disenchantment, Scientific nat uh, Naturalism and Esoteric Discourse. In the annual lecture, Asprin will offer us a sneak peek into his latest research project, the ongoing Swedish Research Council funded project on ascription of magic to Roma people in the early modern and modern periods. The title of his talk today is Magic, Gypsy <laughs> Stereotyping and Roma Agency, Reflections on the Roma in the European History of Magic. So we'll spend one and a half hour together this afternoon. Uh, first, Professor Asprem will give his lecture, and then Professor Solvor uh, mjöberg lauritsen uh, of AMAP will serve as a respondent and discuss it. And after Professor Lauritsen's response, we'll take a very brief break, say, for instance, five minutes or three, <laughs> to allow you to stretch your legs and also to have some coffee and tea which is situated back here in the auditorium. And then finally, we open up for uh, questions and answers and discussion. Uh, some general information before we start. Um, this event is streamed on YouTube and it is recorded. That means that, that the contributions uh, of our two participants uh, are being streamed and recorded, but we will not record the Q&A that follows. For those of you who are here with us in person today, uh, the washrooms are downstairs, and in case of an emergency, you find the escape doors here and back there. So now, I'm very happy to leave the floor for Professor Egil uh, Asper. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh. So thank you very much for that kind introduction uh, and for the uh, invitation to come here to speak with you uh, today about this uh, topic, which um, is my new uh, big research interest and uh, which I hope that you will agree is uh, quite an important subject, actually. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll get to it. And I'd say that uh, the Romani peoples are uh, collectively Europe's largest ethnic minority and also among its most stigmatized what we usually call anti siganism or anti-gypsyism, are a mainstream form of racism, and stereotypes of gypsies have proved hard to dispel. And with these things being so, uh, scholars, and especially non-Romani scholars, uh, who write and talk about Roma, have a special responsibility not only to avoid reproducing such stereotypes, but also to actively interrogate and critique them, especially when they are uh, relevant to one's own discipline and field. Uh, this is, of course, a question of ethics, but it is also, I think, um, uh, a question or uh, taking this kind of critical approach to these issues, it can also yield significant scholarly results and insights. The Roma are, after all, a transnational set of minorities that have participated in the shaping of Europe from the late Middle Ages onwards, so for several, uh, several centuries. Uh, and from the vantage of many different countries. So taking a critical look at the emergence and operation of gypsy stereotyping and trying to push beyond these stereotypes, we stand to learn much not just about the Roma, but also about other Europeans as well. 
Um, and I think that historians of religions have a lot to work at here and a lot to contribute, especially those of us who have been working with topics related to magic, occultism, uh, the esoteric, and so on. And this is because associations with magic, sorcery, and divination are among the most frequently recycled elements in gypsy stereotyping. The image of the uh, quote-unquote gypsy fortune teller is particularly well known and has been reproduced in art and literature from the 16th century onwards. We have Caravaggio's fortune teller here, uh, in which a, a Romani woman in Egyptian headdress and cape reads the hands of a handsome young aristocrat. Uh, this motif became something of a model for European artists. And later, Caravaggesque uh, paintings continue this theme, often with highlighting physical differences in terms of skin color as well. Um, and yeah, also in this little detail from Hendrik Afferkamp's uh, winter scene on the frozen canal, you have this, this team, uh, theme showing up. This is actually quite central, centrally hidden in that famous uh, painting. Uh, you have this, this uh, uh, theme of the uh, uh, fortune teller. Now, um, these representations in high art were part of a settlement of stereotypes about Romani women as fortune tellers and thieves. Um, and this is one of the things I'm going to argue today, that this is this settlement that's happening in the 16th century. So Caravaggio was playing on an already well-known motif, and in fact there were visual representations of it, uh, which uh, could be found already a century earlier in books on chiromancy, physiognomy, and astrology. Um, in other words, uh, in the literature on the occult sciences, the Roma had already been inscribed in, with, uh, in these discourses of, of, of magic and fortune-telling. Uh, but these associations, in fact, go even further back to the, some of the very, very earliest sources that we have. And this brings me to the main questions that I wish to address in this lecture today. Uh, there's three guiding, guiding uh, questions that, uh, that we will be looking at. So first, where did these stereotypes come from? How did they develop over time and why? Because these were not entirely static, and we can see if we can see some reasons for why they were changing in attitude or in, uh, in emphasis. Uh, secondly, what kind of effects have they had on the shaping of anti-Gypsy practices and, and policies? What can we say about that impact on real-life uh, Roma, historically? Uh, and then finally, I want to, to uh, look at a, uh, a bit of a challenge. So can we recover some of the agency of those persons who were covered by stereotypes of Gypsy magic and described by them and who met them? And I will try and answer this uh, in the affirmative and suggest that what is needed in order to do this is a shift in how we work with stereotypes. So instead of only portraying Roma as passive victims of stereotyping from the outside, we also need to uh, try and look at how Roma could appropriate the stereotypes uh, through which they were read and turning them into strategies uh, for survival and for resistance. Um, this is a tricky thing, but it's something I will try and do at the end of the lecture with a concrete example from the early 1700s, where we meet um, uh, a Romani woman on trial uh, who is laying this out uh, in her own words. Own words. So, um, where do gypsy magic stereotypes come from? Uh, in a certain sense, they're actually much older than the Roma as a people. Uh, this is because associating wandering foreigners with dark powers or fraudulent practice is part of a long-standing discourse on magic which has been shaped already since antiquity. Uh, and I will not go very deep into this now. Uh, we have a big enough scope as it is. Uh, but uh, the terms uh, themselves, uh, magia and magoi in Greek antiquity, are derived from the old Persian magus, which in Persia denoted a priestly official. And in the Greek context, the magos then came to signify a type of wandering ritual expert who spoke a foreign language, chanted in Persian, and could offer various private rituals. And in uh, the descriptions here, uh, they could be, uh, um, th these wandering priests could be portrayed either as charlatans and beggars and kind of no-gooders, uh, but also occasionally as, um, as uh, exotic carriers of some kind of ancient, uh, ancient uh, Eastern wisdom associated with Zoroaster and Zarathustra. Um, but now, as Kimberly Stratton has argued, in the wake of the Persian Wars, magic was increasingly linked with xenophobic stereotypes about barbarism um, and was portrayed as the opposite of the values and morals of the emerging Athenian democracy. So magic was just a foreign, effeminate, uh, it broke taboos, uh, it, it incurred ritual pollution that kind of cut people off from the Olympian gods, so it was against religion 
in our terms. Uh, it involved dangerous powers that could also be used for anti-social goals that threaten sort of the social order. Um, so in short, you have all of these things already in antiquity. So kind of uh, trying to systematize it a little bit, you have kind of three faces of the magician already here. So the magician as a foreign demoniac, as a rootless charlatan, or as an exotic carrier of esoteric wisdom. And all of these scripts have uh, survived into the Christian era and been applied to interpret various peoples and, and groups. Um, so, um, turning now to how this has uh, become relevant for interpretations of Roma, uh, we turn first to uh, the East Roman Empire onto, or to Byzantium, um, because associations with magic show up in a big way already in the Byzantine materials relating to the Roma, so some of the earliest material that we have. Uh, in fact, uh, Adrian Marsh has suggested that, it was, uh, that magic was a central component in the formation of Romani ethnic identity, which he uh, dates to sometime starting from the late uh, 11th century in Byzantium. Um, and this uh, development was the result of two factors, according to him. On the one hand, Byzantines were using existing cultural models related to magic for interpreting this new people. And on the other, the proto-Roma's uh, own strategic adaptation of these models for economic reasons were making them sort of legible in that way as well. So there was this kind of meeting uh, between uh, the two. Now, as concerns these proto-Roma, or the ancestor populations of Roma that became Roma sometime maybe in the late 11th century or later, uh, it is now common to assume um, actually a military background here, that their fairly rapid migration from northern India via the Persian world and Armenia to Anatolia uh, is believed to have been a result of the Ghaznavid and Seljuk Wars. Uh, and on this story, the proto-Roma would have reached Anatolia as an incorporated part of the multi-ethnic Seljuk armies. Um, and then having to find other kinds of work uh, uh, when these wars were over. So this is basically Ian Hancock's uh, idea and partially also uh, a Marsh's. But Marsh suggests then that the proto-Romani population underwent a shift in occupation after these events from, as he describes it, client soldiers to service nomads. Um, so some would fill commercial niches as blacksmiths or cauldron makers, while others would start servicing the demand for fortune-telling and divination, which was in high demand in, in uh, um, uh, Byzantium. So, however this may be, and you know, to be fair, we don't really have good sources to say that this is how it happened, there's a lot of speculation, but what is more clear is that the Byzantines uh, attempted to understand this new group <clears throat> by drawing on cultural models from religious myth and history that had to do with magic. And we see this even in the, um, in the um, exonyms that were being used about, uh, about the early Roma. Uh, so in uh, this period, the, the chief one is uh, the term atziganoi, which would later give us terms like zigoina, zigan, ziani, and so on. It comes from this term atziganoi. Now this term uh, requires some explanation. It's not entirely clear, I think. Um, it appears to derived from the name of an Anatolian heterodox religious group, the Athinganoi, uh, which had all but disappeared by the ninth century, um, usually described as a dualistic sort of Manichaean group that was also associated with the practices of magic, astrology, divination, and demonic invocations. Um, but after this group had ceased to exist, the term itself, Athinganoi and Atsinganoi, uh, continued to be used for various other non-Greek, non-Roman uh, groups that were entering through Anatolia and were associated with magic. And this uh, is the way in which it was also then attached to, to the early Roma. Um, so, for example, uh, the earliest source that we have, uh, which ha or that has been taken to refer to Roma, is the Georgian hagiographic text, The Life of St. George the Athenite, which was written on Mount Athos, but in, in Georgian. Uh, and here, this one plays on a heresiological legend, and it explains that the, the wandering magic practicing people called Atsiganoi uh, are, quote, of the lineage of Simon Magus. Uh, so there is this kind of heresiological lineage that it can be connected to. Uh, and these people had been summoned, uh, according to the story, by the emperor uh, at Constantinople to help exterminate with magical means the wild beasts that had taken over his royal gardens in Constantinople. Uh, but the saint was also there, and uh, just like the apostles had brought Simon Magus to the ground, this, uh, the saint uh, exposed the Atsiganois demonic arts with uh, doing the sign of the cross and saying some prayers, and humiliated them. So uh, you have got this clear sort of connection with this, uh, this uh, uh, legend. Um, 
Now, as, hagiography, as a hagiography that clearly riffs on an established trope, the factual content here is highly dubious. Um, and it is also doubtful that the Atsiganoi at this early uh, stage actually refers to Proto-Roma. But uh, it does illustrate how a cluster of re religiously coded associations were attached to the term Atsiganoi uh, when it started to be used about the Roma. So you already have these written into the term when it's starting to be used about, about Roma. And when you then turn to Byzantine ecclesiastical sources from the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, which more reliably refer to Roma, um, you can see that these associations had real social consequences. So, for example, the canonist uh, Theodore Balsamon uh, threatened them with excommunication and uh, listed them among various satanically inspired forms of sorceries. Uh, the patriarch Athanasius I um, urged the clergy to warn their congregations against letting this fortune-telling people into their homes because, quote, they teach devilish things. Um, so you've got this clear sort of translation of, of how they're connected to magic and devilry into real social consequences uh, there. But now let's uh, turn to the Western diaspora. Um, so by the 1300s, Roma had settled on the Peloponnese, the uh, Ionian Islands, the Balkans, and north towards the Danube River. At this point, however, a series of dramatic events, notably the Ottoman expansions, and the enslavement of Romani people in Wallachia and Moldavia, which would last, a slavery that would last until uh, the middle of the 19th century, contributed to the fragmentation of the Roma and also uh, to um, a further di dispersal westwards, which would take um, uh, place at the end of that century. In the autumn of 1417, city chronicles across the German lands um, reported the arrival of a people called variously in those sources, Zigoina, Tartars and Egyptians, and Egyptians will, of course, be one of the new big sort of family of, of exonyms, uh, giving us things like gypsy and so on. Uh, so probably arriving from the contested border areas of the Hungarian Kingdom and the Ottoman Empire, these would over time give rise to the northwestern family of Romani minorities, so the Kale, the Manush, the Sinti, Romanical, Reisende, Reisende in Scandinavia, and so on. Uh, References to magic, and particularly to palm reading, does appear also in these early European accounts, uh, but they are few and far between. I think this is important to point out. The dominant interpretation of the Roma in the West, in, in the beginning, is that they are uh, pilgrims from a place called Little Egypt. It's unclear a little bit, little bit where that exactly is meant to be. Is it in Egypt, somewhere else in Africa, or somewhere else um, uh, east? Um, so they're from Little Egypt, they are uh, pilgrims, they're doing penance for having temporarily abandoned Christianity as their lands had been invaded by, by Muslims or Saracens. This is kind of the story that's taking root here. Uh, and as such, as pilgrims and uh, sort of refugees, they should be treated hospitably, and generally it appears that they were uh, in most of these early um, uh, chroniclers. So they were given alms in the form of uh, food, so bread, uh, um, uh, meat, uh, beer, wine, and so on. Uh, but so the first reference to magic comes in 1418, so a year after their earliest appearance. And of the 60 or so contemporary records that we have up until 1450, there's only a handful, or maybe a handful and a half uh, uh, of mentions of it. Um, now, there are a few observations to make here about these early uh, references. First, the demonic interpretation that we met in uh, Byzantine materials is not so common in the West. Uh, indeed, there are some accounts, like in Aras in 1421, that were quite neutral, reporting, for example, uh, about, uh, quote, wonderful strangers who have come from the land of Egypt. The women read from the hands of the people. They told them very many strange things. Um, but there's no further sort of, um, uh, yeah, denounce, uh, denouncing this. Uh, we do find a couple of instances, or at least the one very clear instance, where uh, a chronicler would mention the practice of evil arts, uh, even the summoning of spirits, and this is in Macon in 1419. But the most common complaint, to the extent that the Western accounts actually did complain about anything uh, magic-related, uh, would be that uh, the uh, fortune-telling of the women was a pretext for theft. So this accusation could go hand in hand with the belief that the women had real occult powers. So it's not necessarily that they were charlatans, but there were theft occurring in the connection with these, uh, these sessions. 
Uh, and we see this actually in a rather spectacular and I think revealing in many ways entry from Bologna in 1422. Uh, so Bologna 1422, it's the summer, of the, um, there's a, a, a certain Duke Andrea from Little Egypt who uh, is coming to Bologna, is staying there with uh, his wife and uh, his entourage, his people, about 100 people, uh, staying for two weeks in Bologna while they're on a pilgrimage to Rome. Um, the Duke's wife was a skilled soothsayer and the chronicler actually states that, quote, in many cases she told truly, so um, even these outsiders uh, would say that she had some skills. Uh, people flocked to the square to have their fortunes told, but the chronicler claimed only to have their purses stolen and pieces of their dress cut off. Now, whatever was behind this, uh, what actually happened, uh, it's clear that hostilities soon ensued because the authorities in Bologna ordered fines and excommunication for anyone dealing with the Egyptians. So anyone who would go there to have their hands read would, uh, for, would be uh, threatened with excommunication. And in a remarkable reversal of roles, they even permitted townspeople to rob the foreigners, steal their horses, and drive them out of the town. So, yeah. Uh, a reverse of roles, for sure. Uh, now, it is also clear that uh, stereotypes of fortune telling and, and uh, theft circulated quite widely in the population by the 1420s, but people did not necessarily believe it all the time. So there's an interesting document, uh, the diary of an anonymous uh, burger of Paris, Paris uh, um, who, who writes for 1427, uh, that um, the Parisians kept saying that the Egyptians who are now staying on the outskirts of town, that they, uh, they will read hands and then they will steal your money. Your money will go away if you go there. That's what people would say. But then he says that I've gone there several times. I've talked with them. I've been there. I've seen nothing of this. I haven't seen any fortune telling and I certainly haven't been uh, off with any money. Uh, so there would be this kind of uh, knowledge that what is being said is not necessarily correlating with the truth, and perhaps you should go and find out yourself. So already in the 15th century, you have this. But the kinds of stereotypes from Bologna and Paris would become uh, canonized and reach a kind of settlement in the first encyclopedic descriptions of the Roma as a people, which were published in the 16th century. In this literature, uh, it's really this sort of ruthless charlatan image that would take the upper hand in terms of interpreting what the magic is all about. Uh, this um, uh, development, I think, also is connected with another shift in interpretation of Roma, which is taking place around this time, namely uh, what you could call their de-racialization. So they go at this point from having been understood as Egyptians you know, from some foreign exotic place, um, to uh, now when they have dwelled in Western Europe for generations, commentators start to question their authenticity. So English sources start talking about counterfeit Egyptians uh, as they are just you know, pretending to be Egyptian. Uh, and they would then note certain things as, oh, but you know, they, they have all been born here in Europe. You know, they haven't been born in Egypt, so therefore they must be European. Uh, or that uh, there are ordinary Germans or French or English who have married into these families and therefore it's not authentic, or they speak the local language as well, therefore it's not authentic. Uh, uh, and also there were rumors that, oh, they're just, they're just painting their, their um, faces black to look more exotic. Uh, so what was happening here is that commentators started denying that Roma were a real people, a real nation uh, in the nomenclature. Uh, they were just a ragtag of social outcasts, liars and misfits. And this would form, in fact, a separate track in European anti-Gypsyism that's born here and which continues uh, into the 20th and 21st century as well, uh, in which ethnicity is denied to certain of these groups, while stereotypes instead start playing on class and the need for disciplining. Uh, and I think that an em emphasis on their magic as being fraudulent went hand in hand with this notion of kind of being counterfeit in some way. Now, a clear and influential example of this uh, kind of connection and this encyclopedic literature is Sebastian Münster's Cosmographia Universalis uh, from the 1550 version and onwards. Uh, this was an, incre an incredibly successful encyclopedic work on uh, geography and the peoples of the world, a kind of ethnographic uh, atlas, if you will, um, which went through like, numerous editions in German, was translated into Latin, French, Italian. Everybody was reading it to find out you know, who are the various peoples of Europe, Africa, Asia, and so on. And it had an entry uh, on uh, what uh, Minister called Zyginer, it also Tartars, Ziani, heathens, and vagabonds, using all of these exonyms that were circulating on the continent. 
And I wrote here in this highly um, um, spread and sort of widely distributed work that they were, quote, a race born on the march, lazy, without any national home. Their men were all idle, and they only supported themselves on the thievery and the fortune-telling of the women. That's the only source of income. Uh, a perhaps interesting detail here is that uh, this book, Cosmographia, included printed marginalia on the page to kind of highlight points of particular interest. And in this entry on Zygina, there's only one such, uh, such marginalia, and that is precisely to point out that they are a, a quote, people intent on divination, gens divinationibus intenta. And this is where you can read about this economic, you know, they're only uh, supporting themselves on the thievery and divination of women, which presumably then is what people were wanting to hear and were interested in, uh, and the reason why this uh, article was written. Now, uh, a couple of important consequences of this settlement of stereotypes and kind of its uh, spread uh, through these encyclopedias uh, should be discerned here. <clears throat> First is that the, the 16th century encyclopedic descriptions would be projected backwards in time when chroniclers writing after these had come out uh, would start describing the events of the 1400s and using the language and the images that were now uh, becoming common in how they describe what happened in 1417 and so on. So we have a lot of contaminated source material, actually, uh, when it comes to, to this. There is a kind of a falsification of the earlier history. This is also why I was talking so much about contemporary uh, witnesses when we were talking about the early decades. Um, so, so this is one effect that's happening here. Uh, another thing is that these encyclopedias and the late chronicle, chronicles that are influenced by them become sources for learned dissertation and also for juridical discussions moving forward. Uh, and one clear example or interesting example of this is uh, Jacob uh, Thomasius and his Dissertatio Philosophica de Singaris from 1652. Um, Thomasius was uh, an influential philosopher. He was a teacher of Leibniz. Uh, and he was also uh, a jurist in, uh, in Saxony. So he had some influence on the legal debate. And in this book, he argued uh, why it is that the Roma should be rounded up and deported. And these were legislations that were now spreading like wildfire across uh, the continent. Uh, there had been similar legislations before as well, but right now uh, we have one of those uh, movements where more and more countries are are trying to uh, push Roma across the borders to the next country, who are trying to push them to the next country, and so on and so forth. And so that's what he's legitimizing here, and he's doing that by uh, listing just a wide range of uh, reasons based on the often contradictory stereotypes that have been produced over the past century. So they are liars and gamblers, they are also Turkish spies, they are heathens, they are uh, traitors to Christianity, uh, but they are, they're, they're, they're dubious foreigners, but they are maybe also just uh, outcasts who are blackening their faces, all of this. And then he ends by also mentioning that they are sorcerers and enchanters, uh, and that they are especially deft at, quote, controlling fire by magical art. I'm not entirely sure where he's getting that, but he seems to be suggesting that there is also some um, element here of real dangerous power going on, in addition to all this counterfeit stuff. So everything is just in one uh, go, and whatever it is, it's bad. Uh, now, so we also find that laws against fortune-telling could be combined with laws against anti-vagrancy, uh, sorry, anti-vagrancy legislation, so not against yeah, against vagrancy, not anti-vagrancy, um, uh, in order to target uh, Roma, and that both of these two types of legislation could also be parroted and integrated into explicit anti-gypsy legislation that just sort of, uh, sort of outlaw uh, being Roma. Uh, to take just one example of dozens and dozens, uh, which is more close to home, uh, so Sweden, the royal decree of 1662 on Tartare Oxygener, uh, listed uh, fortune-telling as one of those ungodly activities that legitimized the harsh policy that, they, uh, that it uh, now recommended against these vagrants. So they're vagrants, they're ungodly, and they're doing fortune-telling. And what should be done? Well, they should be deported when encountered, or if they had committed any crime, they should be executed without trial. Uh, that was the uh, word of, of the uh, decree. Uh, now, a later Swedish decree, 1741, when things have mildened a little bit uh, in that regard, um, is kind of interesting because it's repeating the same language. You know, the same language that's in here is being repeated by other legislation, so talking again about 
fortune telling and godly behavior vagrancy um, uh, of, of the Roma, but it's expanding its scope to include all people who did not practice any, quote, legal or useful art, including, uh, quote, Jews, lion dancers, comedians, and other jugglers. They should also be uh, thrown out of the country. So, I don't know, this might have been the moment in history when the Swedes lost their sense of humor. I, I'm not sure, speaking of stereotypes. Uh, now, I'm gonna shift, uh, shift focus a bit now. And I've probably taken much too much time anyhow. Um, so it's actually not so hard to show uh, that the magic stereotype has legitimized much repression. I think that's clear enough by now. But if this is all that we do, and coming now to my third uh, point, the, the challenge, if this is all that we do, we risk also portraying the Roma solely as passive, uh, passive victims who have things happening to them people pushed around by authorities and outsiders without any agency or subjectivity of their own. Now, this problem has been discussed at length in post-colonial theory, where you have kind of encountered the same problem. So, uh, Homi Baba, for example, has argued that simply dismissing stereotypical discourse as being wrong or bad from the perspective of my own personal normative position is not so helpful. It doesn't necessarily bring us that far. Instead, what scholars should be doing is uh, to seek to understand what he calls the process of subjectification made possible and plausible through stereotypical discourse. And I take this to mean something like uh, uh, what kinds of, you have to ask, like what kinds of subjects are made possible through the stereotypes? What kind of self consciousness can you develop in relation with this stereotype? Um, what kind of agency do they allow for? And also, how are stereotypes uh, negotiated in a wider context of domination and resistance uh, to them as well, and kind of negotiating with them? And I think that this kind of perspective is especially important, actually, uh, when we are encountering examples uh, which may, on the surface, seem as if they are um, as if they are supporting uh, the stereotype. So if you have people behaving in such a way that it looks like they're confirming it, that's exactly when you start asking these kind of questions. What is the room for agency here? Why are they doing what they're doing? And might there be a different uh, sort of uh, narrative at play here? And this is where I want to get at uh, in a little bit here. Uh, but anyhow, doing all this uh, for our topic of magic and the Roma requires that we also focus on the interactions between Roma and non-Roma around uh, magic. Um, and here, I think it's, it's really important to just say uh, what should be obvious, that magic uh, was not only a language of alterity to Europeans, um, uh, but it has also been a prized commodity and a desired uh, commodity by members of all sorts of social strata. Uh, in, uh, so at the time when, when Roma uh, um, arrived in uh, the late Middle Ages, but also throughout the early modern period and even today, uh, it has been desired, magical services have also been desired. Uh, so uh, what this means is that th there has been something like an occult service sector, you know, uh, an economy for the, the trading in these kind of illicit goods, uh, whether they are curses or the breaking of curses, uh, or they are talismans and, you know, uh, whatever it is. There's been an economy for this, and this economy has functioned as a zone of interaction where um, people from different social strata, but also different ethnic groups, different religious groups, have been able to get together. Uh, and precisely because you have these stereotypes that attribute uh, um, sort of uh, magical knowledge, magical competence in these exotic others. And so that's where you have to go. So the historian Daniel Lichte, for example, has shown this very well for Venetian Jews uh, who were really, you know, literally uh, walled in in, in in the ghetto in, in, in Venice, that they had some space for actually meeting uh, Christians on... Uh, even from a kind of perspective of relative power, when these Christians came to them to buy these secret sort of, uh, yeah, practices that they could offer. Um, so, so I'm arguing that something similar uh, is taking place also for Roma. And the question is how to, how to find sort of evidence of this. And there's various ways in which you can go, but right now I'm just going to go in one specific way, uh, which is to um, argue that we can substantiate this through certain historical uh, documentation of some early modern Romani women who, in their own words, have, have, have talked about this. Um, so I'm currently working with a series of trial records in, in Swedish archives, and I would like to make a shout out here to my uh, very generous collaborator, uh, uh, Sebastian Kalsinger, uh, who I'm collaborating on this. Um, so 
uh, in these, in these uh, records, we can follow a number of interconnected Romani families that established a presence in Scandinavia at the end of the 1600s and who are uh, the, uh, among the ancestors of the Nordic Romani minorities now today as uh, Riesande, Reisende, uh, probably also uh, Kale or Finnish Roma. Um, and so here I want to focus on just one particular individual and one particular case in which she features. She features in many. Uh, and this is precisely one of those cases where you would first think, okay, this is really confirming the stereotype full on. But I would uh, challenge and say that this can be read in such a way that uh, we can get something else out of this. Uh, the person in question is Anna Maria Adamsdotter. Uh, she was a woman who was probably born around 1680 in uh, Frankfurt. Uh, that's the one place which she claims the most often that she has been born. Uh, uh, but she spent most of her life in Sweden and what is today Finland. Uh, Anna Maria's life was extraordinary in many ways. Uh, she was sentenced to death, not once, but three times, uh, and she always escaped with her life intact. Uh, the first death sentence that she received was actually one of those occasions where the court invoked this, you know, uh, uh, this um, uh, law that I talked about before, the, uh, the royal decree of 62 on Tartar and Sigena. So they used that in order to legitimize a death sentence, which was since repealed. Anyhow, um, she was multilingual. We find her speaking Swedish, German, French, and also Romani. Um, she is, in fact, the, the, earliest, the source of the earliest recorded Romani in Scandinavia that we know of right now, from 1709. And on top of all of this, uh, she has also left us with an artifact that, through a complicated story of archival relocations and misinterpretations, has survived and made it to the Nordic Museum in Stockholm, where it has until now been presented in the context of witchcraft. Uh, which it was not a context of. Uh, but instead, I'm going to show now that um, this artifact is in fact connected to a specific set of survival strategies that she had crafted, uh, which involve magic in some way. Now, many of these details I just mentioned, uh, in fact, appear together in the very same trial, which took place in Karlskrona in the south of Sweden in Blekinge in 1709. Um, and as trial materials go, uh, you must, of course, read these suspiciously, especially when we're dealing with, uh, with uh, a charged subject like magic and ethnic minorities and women, all of these kind of things on top of each other. Uh, it's very uh, obvious you need to ask about, you know, is the accused being pressured here? Uh, are they playing along to save their skin? Uh, are the transcriptions even accurate? A lot of questions like this come up. Uh, with all of that in mind, this trial really gives us a lot to, to work with still. Um, and uh, throughout the trial, we find Anna Maria speaking with great confidence, explaining the details of her practices with pride. She uses irony, she uses ridicule to discuss sort of the superstitions of the majority Swedes. Um, and she appeals to the court's rationality and of course to her own rationality by doing so. Um, now, as this trial opened, uh, it actually had nothing to do with magic. It was not a trial about magic. It was, the background was that uh, a merchant in Karlskrona had accused Anna Maria of having stolen seven pairs of socks that had gone missing from his stall on Christmas Eve on the market. Um, and as the trial opened, Anna Maria admitted that she had indeed possessed socks matching the description and quantity, but had a different story as to how she had acquired them. The socks had been given as payment from a, quote, girl in a blue sweater who had come up to her at the market asking to have her fortunes told and to get some, uh, some help with finding a husband, some magical help finding a husband. And I think here we see Anna Maria also suggesting that, you know, of course people would come up to her randomly on the street uh, thinking that she has these kind of powers. And so the court would also know this. This is uh, something she's uh, building on here. Uh, so she said that she had agreed to help the girl <coughs> and had given the girl a piece of dried and diced root which was to be tied in, tied in a piece of cloth and beaten over the desired husband's back. Uh, and this would so kindle the man with love that he would, quote, find no rest whether day or night. Uh, but all of this, Anna Maria told the court, had been pure humbug. She didn't believe any of it herself. Uh, it was just a useful way to make some extra money off of those simple-minded people that did. And simple-minded is a direct quotation here. Ian Faldiga. Um, um, Right, and then, yeah, she had performed these tricks uh, through Denmark and southern Sweden, she said, uh, all, over this, all over the place, just as her mother and her mother-in-law had done before her. 
Now, for the court, this completely unsolicited explanation of how she had acquired stolen socks raised more questions than answers. So they uh, dismissed her testimony and found her guilty of theft, but then they also initiated a completely new sequence of investigations concerning the fortune-telling, enchantment, and fraudulent arts that she had now admitted to, but which they had actually dismissed that testimony. So, but in any case, um, in the ensuing in interrogations, the court was particularly interested in finding out whether there was anything idolatrous or demonic going on, and also in finding out what other kinds of occult arts might she be practicing. Um, and they also show a greater interest in ethnic signifiers, such as her Romani language, which they have questions about. Anna Maria, on her part, continued to strike a defiant and rational tone. Uh, in a paraphrase, we could say that her attitude is that if the Swedes are stupid enough to believe in magic, that's their prerogative. And if they want to pay her for providing it, she's happy to take their money. Uh, that is not a direct quote, but this is sort of the, the attitude. Um, a number of types of services were described, such as removing curses, curing cattle from uh, magic-induced illness, uh, compelling a thief to return with stolen property, magically removing rodents, and so on and so forth. So, so really stock elements of, of so-called folk magic, the kind of thing you would expect uh, uh, to get magic help from uh, for somebody who, who can, can do magic. Um, but uh, in all of the procedures that Anna Maria described, uh, they included also this really striking sleight of hand tricks, kind of illusionist tricks that she would use to create the illusion of a miraculous effect uh, uh, that uh, would uh, uh, often happen also in combination with her speaking some mysterious sentences in Romani. Uh, and all of this in order, uh, she said, uh, to, to manufacture credibility or unseende by, by doing this, that she really has uh, these powers. So she seems very sort of, uh, uh, she pushes on this, that, you know, this is how I do it to, to seem credible in, in actually possessing magic powers, and they buy it. Uh, I will just give you one example now, which involves the striking skull-shaped artifact that we saw before. Uh, and in this particular trick, uh, the artifact is used to enhance the effect of a fortune-telling session. So upon arriving at the farm, uh, Anna Maria would ask the farmer or his wife to fetch an egg and to hold the egg in their own hand. She would then tell them that if misfortune is afoot, uh, there would be a devil in the egg. Anna Maria would then hide the skull figure under her own left thumb, like this, hold it over the egg. She would say some words over it in her own language, in Romani. Then she would smash the egg and reveal this, uh, this demonic figure coming out of the egg. Uh, and this revelation then, of course, would, uh, would cause the clients to be, quote, strengthened in their belief, she said, and it would lead to the demand for, for protective services. Uh, and in all of this, she had done nothing wrong. Uh, because, quote, anyone is free to let himself be fooled who believes in it. Now, before wrapping up, I wanted to um, add a couple of, of points or observations to this. Uh, the first is that um, the practices, uh, as Anna Maria describes them, they were part of a female-coded tradition of sorts, uh, but a tradition that was not really for the in-group. It was developed exactly to play on and to monetize those stereotypes and expectations that were put on her from the outside. Um, she claimed to have learned all of her tricks from older female relatives, and she had also started to pass them on to her own daughters. And one of them, uh, the oldest daughter, Dorothea, is also present in this, uh, in this court case and, and talks a bit about this. Uh, so that's, in that sense, a tradition. You know, it's something that's being passed, passed down. Um, and uh, it's also the case that variations on this specific egg trick that I just described are actually attested in a number of other, much later sources, completely... Uh, without any connection to this that's been buried in the archives, indicating that the tradition has some resilience. Uh, so uh, we have evidence from uh, Sinti in Turingia in the 19th century and among Polskarom in the 20th and a number of other examples uh, of, of this, variations on this. And, you know, maybe not interpreted in the same way or done exactly the same way, but there are connections here. Uh, a second point concerns the use of language of Romani. Uh, so Anna Maria was forced to tell the court what she had said during those rituals when she spoke uh, Romani, or Tartarsk, as the as a gypsy, as the court called it. Uh, she reluctantly gave this, uh, uh, but the court, the court then also forced her to translate what she had said. Uh, this took even more persuasion. She really, really did not want to translate it into Swedish. But uh, eventually she did. Uh, but the translation was, however, not recorded in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the archival sources that we have. 
The court noted only that it had, quote, such an indecent and foul meaning that for the sake of modesty and decency, one will not cite it here. Um, in fact, the opening sentences of this Roman text uh, are still quite easily decipherable, so we can see what it says. And lo and behold, the, the exotic magic spell uh, was really a series of insults of an explicit sexual nature. And I'll, I'll say nothing more while the camera is rolling. Um, so, moving on to some conclusions. Uh, what emerges in the case of Anna Maria Adam's daughter is, I think, not, you know, she's not a sorcerer, she's not like a, a fortune teller as such, that's not really the main thing. She is a skilled performer who is performing within a tradition uh, that exploits a stereotyped role that is not only projected on her from the outside, that's primarily what it is, of course, that's what's making this uh, possible to, to happen in the first place, but it is also being co-produced between her and enacted between her and the majority uh, population. And by doing so, she's turning it into an economic survival strategy on the one hand, but also using it as a mode of cultural resistance on the other. So as, a, as economic strategy, it added to other sources of income uh, when times were tough. So it's important to point out that this was certainly not the main form of sustenance, uh, not by far. It's something that's done occasionally. Uh, so for her and her family, they had many other, many other sources of income. Uh, her male partners would regularly take work uh, in the military, for example, which was common for Romani men at, at this period, both in Scandinavia and on the continent. Uh, and she would herself uh, trade in, in horses, in metals, in uh, handicraft. Uh, we find her, for example, uh, selling tin to Sami, so that they can embroider this, uh, this nice um, uh, uh, sort of leather uh, bags, uh, and she can take them to sell them elsewhere. So there's this kind of interconnection also with other minorities selling stuff. Uh, so that's important to say. I mean, this magic stuff is not defining her economic activity. It's an additional thing. Um, and secondly then, as a mode of cultural resistance, I argue that this was a way to subversively reappropriate the stereotypes that she uh, was met with, in order to express and perform, temporarily at least, some kind of superiority over the majority population, and uh, hopefully then to, to boost also the self-confidence of her own group by doing this. So, in sum, this case illustrates, I think, some of what we would miss if we only treat stereotypes as things done to somebody, uh, effectively denying agency and complexity of character to those women who were targeted by stereotypes and legislation. And now, sure, I mean, Anna Maria was, due to her ethnicity, an unwanted citizen and almost fell victim to these draconian anti-gypsy legislations, as we saw. She was uh, sentenced to death for being uh, a Tartara. Uh, and yes, fraudulent fortune-telling was one of the stereotypes that was baked into that very legislation that they used to sentence her. Uh, a stereotype that her own actions, in a certain sense, reinforced. But when it comes to Anna Maria's own relation with magic, her reasons for doing what she did, uh, as given to us in her own words, uh, I think the story should really be one of opportunity, of clever survival skills, and of trying to turn a liability into an asset as best as she could. Uh, she's trying to fill a market niche and to navigate in a hostile environment. Uh, in the process, stereotypes about magical gypsies could be exaggerated for credibility, while the customers were secretly ridiculed through the obscenities that were hidden in those exotic spells that they had so craved. And uh, I'll stop there with those words. Thank you. to welcome Solvo Leritsen to give her response. Um, Solvo Leritsen is a professor of educational science and the PI of the project Memorobia, Memorialization of Romani Enslavement in Territories of Contemporary Romania. Thank you. Um, thank you, Egil. Um, um, yeah, I, um, um, yeah I, I just first, yeah, just <laughs> I, um, I, I just first want to say that uh, I wasn't supposed to be the only uh, respondent today. Uh, so we have this uh, situation that we're not so happy about, that we are two non-Roma people talking about a Roma, a Roma topic. Uh, but we had um, um, a, a late decline from a colleague, but um, um, luckily the audience is more diverse, and I hope the Q&A will bring more um, 
um, yeah, uh, insights and diversity to, um, to the table. Uh, also, my research is not so much historical, so I tend to uh, um, think <laughs> in sort of a, a contemporary um, situation. So, if, um, yeah, uh, that's... Um, uh, but so I will start with a digression actually about the, the research project that, that um, I, I'm working on in Roma uh, slavery, um, uh, together with my colleagues Magda Matako de Gregore, Maria Domita, and Jan Selling. And we were in June in um, uh, in Romania in June uh, doing field work. And uh, this is a digression, but it is a digression because it shows somehow the importance of this historical research also for contemporary. Because in, inter in interviews with um, uh, church uh, clergy in very high positions in the Romanian Orthodox Church, uh, it was not uncommon in our, in in our interviews that uh, they claimed that uh, Roma uh, are not uh, real Christians uh, because they are too superstitious. So you see this stereotype uh, that uh, uh, you have um, entangled, uh, <laughs> showed us, uh, somehow is still uh, still living on and still influencing um, Roma lives. Um, I have um, uh, two questions um, and a challenge for you, Egi. Uh, and the first one is about uh, academic uh, antagonism and uh, dictinorism. Uh, when I was um, preparing for this uh, response, I looked at two reports that were published in uh, 2021. The first one is uh, authored by Dr. Julius Dostas for the Council of Europe, and the second one is from the um, uh, Independent um, Commission on Antigypsism that was uh, delivered to the German Bundestag in 2021. And uh, they both sort of try to uh, theorize around antigypsism and the different uh, forms of antigypsism where uh, religious um, anti-gypsism um, is, uh, is one, also romanticizing uh, anti-gypsism, I think you also touch upon, and uh, cultural uh, anti-gypsism. But, um, uh, but I also know that you have done work on, uh, on dictilorism and academic anti-gypsism, which is another um, uh, criterion. They, of course, overlap, and I think this is a topic where we clearly show that the different types of anti-gypsism overlap a lot. And what the Independent Commission states uh, is that um, the academic anti-gypsism, on the one side, they have uh, um, legitimized uh, existing prejudice, but uh, that uh, academic anti-gypsism has also given rise, or, or academia has also given rise to new uh, prejudice. Um, and my question on that is um, if you can elaborate a bit on uh, the role of uh, science in this field of um, uh, uh, Roma and um, uh, the stereotype of Roma and mag magic. Um, and the second, my second question is, um, uh, since we are in uh, Norway, uh, I wanted to <laughs> challenge you to say something about uh, the Norwegian uh, context. Um, and especially I was uh, thinking about the um, uh, national minority Romano Folk Tatra or Norwegian travelers and um, the forced uh, assimilation uh, policies that they have been subject to. And um, uh, um, together with my colleague Ingun Odlan, uh, I've, uh, recently we are working on uh, the, uh, looking at uh, theological arguments, uh, how theological arguments influenced anti-nomadic um, uh, attitudes and practices. And you say something about how anti-nomadism and this stereotype of uh, uh, Roman magic have sort of played alongside each other. And I wanted to ask if you can say something about this in the Norwegian context, if the discourse on Roman magic has, um, has it been important here? Um, and if, uh, and if, if, it, if it has, how, how did it travel um, to Norway? And uh, how these anti-nomadic and anti-magic sentiments entangled? if they did. Um, those were my two questions, and then finally I have a challenge. <laughs> and that is because, uh, because this is not uh, only a historical uh, <laughs> study and a uh, academic exercise <laughs> to, to talk about this, but it is actually a topic that is uh, limiting uh, and um, uh, um, disturbing Roma lives uh, today. Um, and I think all of us, 
have encountered this stereotype of the Roma fortune teller, and uh, we will probably encounter it again. So my question to you, because now that we have uh, listened to you and we have all this knowledge, we ha also have a responsibility to challenge that stereotype, and, but we don't always have 45 minutes, so I wondered if you can give me uh, and us a, a two-minute uh, sort of um, what we can say uh, uh, to dismantle this stereotype next time we encounter it. Hmm? Well, well. <coughs> so I'll allow you to answer that very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want All us to have the break first so you can think about it? Five minutes? I, s I hear somebody saying break yeah, first. Okay, break so five minutes. In okay, that case, let's take the break and then we'll continue.
So now we're all looking forward to the answers to the questions and uh, the challenge that's over right here. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to see what that will be. Um, so thanks a lot for, for the um, questions, uh, Solvoy. Um, sure, I think it's maybe still here. Yeah, she's still here. Uh, so I got two questions and one challenge. The first question is the role of science in sort of uh, shaping, reshaping uh, these sorts of magic-based stereotypes. Uh, and uh, I'll start with that one. So I mean, there's se several ways in which you could answer that. In, in, uh, so, so first, of course, is also uh, what is science and in which period and so on. And so even in this talk that I gave here, I would say that it's an interesting thing that what, what was really making things move fast is when you get these, uh, this knowledge, form of knowledge production in the form of encyclopedias, which are uh, authorized knowledge, uh, kind of in brief form, saying what's, what's this about? What's about uh, the people of Spain? What's about the people of uh, uh, you know, Saxony? What's, what's the thing about the Roma? And then that becomes like the answer, which everybody else starts to quote, and which is kind of spinning around and around and around, the same kind of stories. Uh, so even in that period, I would say that you could see something like a form of scientific knowledge production having an important part in reproducing these, uh, and producing and reproducing these uh, things. But you're, you're really wanting to hear about the 19th and 20th century, I think. And so I've also done some research on the, the Gypsy Lore Society, which uh, was, you know, still actually exists as uh, sort of the main scholarly organization for the study of in, well, Romani studies, but as they would say now. Um, so this was founded in the late 19th century, 1882, Two, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and consisting mostly of ethnologists and uh, historians, philologists, and you know, a broad uh, number of people. And I've been doing some research on uh, the first president of this society, uh, uh, namely uh, this uh, American, uh, Charles uh, Godfrey Leland, uh, who had moved to Britain, and uh, he'd, he'd done a lot of different kinds of things, but late in his life he became sort of an ethnologist after having met English gypsies and learned language and been very fascinated uh, with their magic, among other things. Uh, then he became the first president of the Gypsy Lore Society, and he wrote this book called uh, Gypsy Sorcery and Fortune Telling uh, in 1891. <coughs> and that book um, is still amazingly, so I mean, uh, what is that, uh, 130 years later, uh, one of very few like full monographs on that topic. Uh, and that book itself has been reproduced several times. It came in a second edition in, in the 60s. And what's interesting there with the 6, 1960s edition is that uh, it was specifically also targeted at a certain kind of readership outside of academia, namely the counterculture uh, generation. So people who were also interested in sp uh, kind of occultism, uh, spirituality, uh, paganism, they should read this to find out sort of uh, the mysteries of uh, gypsy magic and so on. And so it really um, had uh, started a lot of interest in that field from, let's say, uh, white middle class uh, occultists, let's say, uh, uh, kind of then spreading some of these stereotypes to that uh, context, but more in this romantic uh, version that you talked about. Uh, so Leland is important in that regard. There's also a lot of other things I could say about this guy because it turns out that he himself, <coughs> so one of the things that he tried to do there was actually to square two of the opposing stereotypes, the one being that they possess uh, you know, real occult powers, the other being that they're all frauds. Uh, and he argues that it's both. Uh, so the Roma had um, originally started off feigning magic, so you know, claiming to do these things in order to make money, but then over generations, they had developed psychic powers. And so they've actually become clairvoyants. Uh, so this guy, Leland himself, was very interested in psychic research and clairvoyance and telepathy and so on. So he had a personal interest in the occult himself, which he attributed to the Roma in that book. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a, this strange sort of combination then of uh, scholarship, uh, occult practice on the part of that scholar <laughs> and uh, yeah, shaping notions of uh, the Roma later on. Uh, I don't know if that begins to answer your question a little bit. It's just it's, it's one example, in a way, um, of, uh, of, of the role of science in uh, that particular uh, field. Um, now, the, the, the other question was about Norway. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a bit embarrassing. I mean, uh, I'm, my, my first my first nationality is Norwegian, but I know less, I think, about the Norwegian context uh, yet. At least I'm going to look more into this. So especially when it comes to legislation and exactly how things. But I mean, one thing is clear enough that uh, sort of the, the Danish Norwegian, so the Denmark Norway laws on on Roma were if possible, worse than the Swedish, and they started earlier, and a lot of the, the Swedish legislation was actually taken from the Danish example. Uh, so I, I figure it's pretty similar, um, but I haven't looked specifically at the role of fortune telling in those, uh, those texts. Uh, what I can say, though, maybe because you also talk, took up uh, this connection between vagrancy and uh, this notion that you know they're not real Christians and uh, and magic and that's something that I think maybe I can highlight again that what uh, you know what is the the function of fortune telling uh, in these sorts of um, anti-gypsy uh, practices and I think one of the functions is precisely uh, okay so as I mentioned of course it's an uh, economically suspect behavior that's that's one thing um, uh, but it's co connected to anti-vagrancy in that it sort of reinforces uh, a, a pre-existing um, skepticism towards people who travel around on the road without any proper occupation. It's, it's what they do. They do fortune telling. That's one way they can, can, uh, can support themselves. But then, more importantly, I think it's, it's been used in this sort of against Christianity type uh, questions as well. And this is actually baked into um, anti-fortune telling uh, um, uh, legislations that are not directed at Roma, but just in general. And especially, I think, after the Reformation, uh, this notion that... Uh, uh, fortune tellers are tempting the flock to turn away from God. Uh, they should, uh, you know, uh, have their uh, the trust and, and faith uh, in God that, you know, he will solve everything. If they're turning to a fortune teller, they are basically practicing a kind of idolatry. They're, they're turning away from God and to something else. And so they are a threat to the, the moral and religious order of society. And you see this sort of in... Uh, in, in a lot of legislation also coming out of sort of post-Reformation uh, Germany, um, Augsburg, and so on. Uh, so that's, I think, a more a, a deep-seated combination, uh, it's kind of a connection which you probably will see in the uh, in uh, Mishun uh, as well, I'm, I'm, I would guess. Uh, and then I, I wanted to talk about, uh, just want to talk about Norway, I do know a, a thing or two about Eilert Sundt. Uh, and Eilert Sundt, uh, you know, he... Uh, he wrote a lot of stuff about uh, uh, Reisende, so the, the uh, <coughs> Norwegian Romani uh, folket. So, Beretninger om Fante og Landstyrke Folke. It's kind of a classic, 1850. Uh, so, uh, there's, it's in, what's interesting about this book is that he has a, a whole chapter on uh, what he calls uh, Tater Religion. Uh, and so there he uh, writes a few things. They're not so much about magic specifically. Um, I, I went through this quite recently, uh, but and there is, um, he talks about some folklore actually that he has in, uh, encountered in Norway, in Gubland Stalin, that he's, he's seen uh, uh, folklore about how uh, Romani women, uh, Tater Kvinner, would, would um, when they have succeeded in, in uh, finding and collecting seven hearts of babies and sort of burnt them in an offering to the evil one, then they will have superpowers and they can do whatever they want, uh, but then their soul will go to the devil after they are dead and so on. So this is apparently, he, he cites that as something that they are saying in Gubran Stalin, so that there would be folklore around the country about Roma uh, that would demonize them in this way, I think it's quite clear, so that magic would enter that way and not only as, as, uh, as fraud, but really as sort of demonic stuff. Uh, uh, but then Eilert Sundt himself, he talks about, uh, you know, um, the Romani people's um, ability for religion, and he talks, uh, says that they have only the capability of half a religion. Um, and this is how he would also then explain that, yeah, they take on the religion of the place that they come to, so you would find Muslim, you would find Catholics, you would find Orthodox, you would find Protestants, but they never go deep in it. They, they know how to parrot what they're saying, but they never understand. Like, in fact, they lack, like, a, he calls, about, calls it like a, um, an organ of the soul that they're lacking in order to see the depths and to feel from within what religion is all about. Uh, sometimes, 
I, when I reread that recently, um, uh, it's almost like he's talking about historians of religions, actually. <laughs> they, they can know all these things externally about religion, but they can't really feel it from within. Uh, but uh, that's, that's one of the things that he's saying, and that's uh, clearly an idea that would also go into these uh, assimilation campaigns later on to try and make proper Christians of them regardless. And then he has some weird hints also of some, uh, he seems to believe that there is a secret cult of moon worship uh, at, at the core of, uh, of uh, the Nordic Romani minorities, uh, the, uh, the worship of uh, Dundra and Alaku, uh, two names for the moon gods that he has heard from one informant uh, that has talked to him and given, given him all of these interesting stories uh, about this and how they have idols to to Alaku that uh, they take up on uh, the midsummer or something like that, and uh, there are initiations, and but he, he cannot really figure it out. But uh, he, he suspects that there is something going on. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, it's just a strange as, as usual when you read on this topic. There's a hodgepodge of ideas that seem to go against each other in various ways, and that's also the case for Sunt uh, on religion. Okay. Uh, now, yeah, and then the third thing was uh, my elevator pitch. How, what would I say in the elevator? Uh, and I was thinking that maybe the best way would be to try and summarize simply the three main points that I was trying to make today, which was first, that, uh, that um, uh, people have attributed magic to the other for all times, and this kind of uh, is a classic script. Uh, of the, the exotic or the dangerous being uh, having magic. So we have religion, they have magic, that's sort of being the, being the, uh, the logic. And this is what happened to Roma II. Uh, that's one thing you could say. Uh, and then you could also say that um, uh, we can actually trace quite clearly how this image was repeated over and over and over again without talking to Roma uh, to create the, manufacture the idea of specific versions of it, such as you know, the connection between theft, theft and, and fortune telling, uh, and that we know this uh, very well, how this worked. And then third, I think also you need to be able to, to, uh, to uh, answer to, or to have a response to the question that you will get if you answer it in this way that I just said, namely, but, but are you saying that Roma have never practiced any form of magic? But I've seen it myself, you know, I've been to a fortune teller. Uh, so you need to have an answer for that, and that's, what I'm trying to do in the third part, right? So yes, uh, this has happened and happens, but it happens precisely because of the stereotype. That's what's making it possible, because people believe that they should be able to, to do these kinds of things. That creates a market, that creates an opportunity. And if you're a marginal, uh, you know, living on the margins of society in some way, you take every opportunity you get. Um, and it's probably also more fun to, to uh, to uh, tell fortunes than to do something else. Uh, so uh, I think, yeah, along those lines. Uh, but definitely finding a way to answer that last sort of counter question you'll get is, uh, is important. And I think that has to focus on, on their agency. What would be the reasons for actually seeming to confirm the stereotype? All right. Thank you so much.